You're going right to, you're going to welcome folks. Yeah, right? I will, but just wait until, yeah. okay, ready? Let me get us both in this thing. Can you move over? Well, you're good right there. You're good. Yeah, don't do, don't do that. <laughs> That's awkward. <laughs> For you. Okay, wait, are we on? Yeah, we're, we're on. Hey. Hey, how are y'all doing? <laughs> we're dorks. We don't, yeah, Ron is distracting me. So, so uh, welcome back to the Commonwealth Matters program here in the Henderson Memorial Baptist Church office Studios. with Ron Hicks. Hey, listen. And you just got an inside track. We didn't know that it was on, but we're on. And uh, we're we're hillbillies with technology is what we are. Hey, dude, speak for yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, hey, we're going to be kicking off the Commonwealth Matters program in just a moment. So, I'm going to do a countdown. There will be a couple of breaks in this, so bear with us. But we're going to be talking about the death penalty. Uh, first federal ex execution in 17 years took place uh, this morning. So stand by, and we're going to kick it off in just a moment. Hey, we do it this way before I hit the record button. We always ask the Lord's blessing. So if you want to join us in a prayer, um, Father, uh, lead and guide our conversation. Help us to be able to share your word, your truth, and not just our opinions. Uh, Lord, we'd ask that you would help us to glorify you, to advance your kingdom uh, through this uh, very controversial topic. So bless our conversation. Bless our listeners. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here we go. You ready? Yep. Welcome to the Commonwealth Matters. I'm your host, Richard Nelson, Executive Director of the Commonwealth Policy Center. And here is a good friend and co-host, Ron Hicks, pastor of Henderson Memorial Baptist Church. Well, thank you, Richard. It's always a pleasure to be able to talk to you about political issues or social issues in, it, uh, from a biblical perspective. It, it's always good to have you. And we joke about you being the color commentary. But on a more serious note, you bring, I mean, you're a good friend, but, yeah. and we've had conversations yeah. over the years, but you bring not just color commentary, but biblical perspective as a pastor. When we talk about social issues, moral issues, political issues, and today's topic is one of the more controversial mm -hmm. and difficult topics to talk about, and that is the issue of uh, executions. Yeah. Uh, this morning, Ron, the first federal execution mm -hmm. in 17 years was carried out. Uh, there was a man by the name of Daniel Lewis Lee of Yukon, Oklahoma, who died by lethal injection at the federal prison in Terre Haute, Indiana. And uh, Daniel Lewis Lee executed an Arkansas family in the 1990s, uh, killed a, a father, a mother, and their eight-year-old son in a plot to build a whites-only nation in the Pacific Northwest. So a grisly murder... Uh, awful uh, motives behind that and this man after several years of appeals was finally uh, put to death by the state and this is something when you think about the crime that was committed or the crimes multiple crimes mm -hmm. that was awful absolutely and then you think about the state taking the life of a man that's awful too mm -hmm. and there's a big movement across the country to do away with the death penalty I've heard one of the rationales behind that is because it, um, first of all, it's not humane for the government to take the lives of people. Another argument is that it's very costly. You have... Uh, well, because the instant appeals and, and all that that goes into it, um, yeah, that's the, the cost. The, of the appeals, and it, I've heard of just very, very uh, high dollar amounts mm -hmm. that is involved with tying up lawyers and the judges and the process which is dragged on for years and years. And in this case, it's been, I, I believe, this man was on death row for uh, 25 years or so. So, a long time. And listeners, you might be thinking to yourself, well, I, th I thought I heard of executions that have taken place. Th those are state-sponsored yeah, um, right. executions. The federal government now and in in federal institutions, uh, or correctional institutions, are, are on a federal level, uh, again, instituting the death penalty. So, it's a, a little different system. Right. John, there, there are a couple of objections to the fe to the death penalty, not just federal, but right. to the state as well. And one is that some argue that it's cruel and unusual punishment, right. which the Constitution prohibits. Right. Now, if you look back to the Middle Ages, you had uh, state governments or, 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 or nations that would put together these really unusual and awful forms of torture yes. for criminals. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear of the, the racks. Well, the tortures the... were usually intended to, to get a confession, 
and once you got a confession, now it's justified to kill the person. So sure. if you're getting pulled in half, you'll say just about anything for them to stop, That's and right. then they stop doing that, and then they chop your head off. Right. So right. You know, not a very good, no. not a way to bring about justice, justice when you're right. under duress mm -hmm. and and uh, being you know, had pain inflicted on you. Uh, so so the U.S. Constitution does prohibit cruel and unusual punishment, but when it comes to execution, the state taking the life of somebody who is duly found guilty, right. um, is that cruel or unusual? Well, um, you know, they, they have ruled before that, you know, there's many methods of doing so. Uh, it used to be firing squad, then hangings, then electrocution, and, and now through the, uh, to, to the giving of, of medications where the person is put to sleep first and all. Um, I, I think the method in which it's used is not so much the cruel and unusual punishment as it is the idea that somebody knows 24 hours beforehand that yeah. they're going to be executed. They're removed to a particular cell. They're able to contact family members, yeah. the last meal, and all the rest of that. So they deal with this idea that, you know, from, from in, in an hour, I will no longer exist. And the person having to deal with that. And then on top of that, whether having electricity course through your body, if you actually feel that, some would suggest that you're being tortured beforehand hanging in that split second, yeah. the, the snapping of the neck and those sort of things. So um, I'm not a doctor, you know, I've had many surgeries though. When they put me to sleep uh, for a second, there's a little bit of anxiety because I don't know what's gonna happen. Right. Right. But uh, you know, if they put me to sleep and then executed me, I, I, there would not, there, yeah, I wouldn't know. There's, yeah. So is, is that cruel and unusual punishment before surgery? No. So let's break this down. At least the cruelty part, what I'm hearing from you is that that is the psychological trauma, just mm -hmm. to know that somebody's going to be put to death. So yeah. it's the psychological impact. Yeah. As and far as unusual, execution is not really unusual. No, no. In the book of Exodus, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. I mean, yeah, in, the yeah, book, no. in the book of Exodus, yeah. uh, chapter 21, um, the, the, the law was an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, foot for a foot, burn for a burn, wound for wound, strike for strike. In essence, what the law was is, if you if you stole my ox, I could do nothing more than take your ox. But if in negligence you cost me my hand, I could uh, I could take your hand, but I couldn't do any more than that. If I took your life, blood for blood, if I took your life, then I would have to pay with my life. And so the Old Testament law was, yeah, yeah. you could only do up to what somebody had done to you, but if they took your life, then representatives of your family could take mine. Right. Now, just to put a finer point on mm -hmm. what you read out of Exodus 21, was that the Israelites were not actually cutting limbs off. Mm -hmm. uh, it, right. There's a the, the, the Latin term, I believe, is lex talionis, which is... Uh, to make sure that the there is just retribution right. for whatever crime was committed. Right. So if somebody was a right-handed person and their hand was cut off, a uh, criminal cuts their hand off, then if that criminal was caught and found guilty, uh, he'd have to pay whatever that right hand would be worth. Right. They'd have to compensate. Right. If somebody's life was unjustly taken, right. the family could put, there are two options. I think they could put a dollar amount on that life, mm -hmm. or they could have the person or required, executed. Yeah, absolutely, right. So there were some options. But you options. couldn't be executed. Like, if you did something that cost me the use of my right arm, I couldn't execute you for that because right. that would be well far and above what you had done that, to me. So that's it was exactly the, the right. equity of the of the justice system. That, that's right. It had to be an equitable mm -hmm. thing. But right. here we're talking about the federal death penalty, which has been reinstituted mm -hmm. in this country, uh, first one in 17 years. And the question is: is is it just? Is it right public policy, or is this something that's inhumane? Is it outdated? Is this something? And then as Christians, Ron, is this something that we should? say, you know what, that's not right for the government to do. Now, what I want us to do is we're going to take a quick break mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and hold on to that thought because okay. I'd like you to come back and answer from a biblical perspective, is the death penalty supported by Scripture. Orthodox Christianity? Okay, all right. Yeah. So stick with us and we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Commonwealth Matters. I'm your host, Richard Nelson, here with Ron Hicks. And the question just prior to the break was, can the death penalty be supported by Scripture? Mm -hmm. Is this something that Orthodox Christianity today can support? Or, Great question. Ron, is this unjust? Is it barbaric? Is it something of the past? Well, it depends on who you ask whether it's unjust. If you ask a completely disassociated third party, they don't have any relationship with the victim, they don't have any relationship with the perpetrator, they can sit back and say, I don't think this is just. Mm -hmm. 
talk to the victim's family, uh, uh, the victim of this gentleman who was executed, who tortured uh, and, and did all these things and executed this entire family to include a child, is that just? One man paying with his life for several lives. They may say, no, it's not just. He should have he should have had to pay more. Uh, there should have been financial compensation. I don't, I don't know. I'm not speaking for the family, but they would say maybe it's not just. I, I quoted in the first segment an Old Testament scripture, and I did that on purpose because some people might say, well, hang on a second. We're New Testament church. We're all, no longer under the law. We're under the, 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 the law of Moses. We're under the law of grace. In the book of Romans, Paul writes to a church that he's not yet visited yet, and he's talking about the government. And he says in Romans 13, 1 through 7, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Mm -hmm. And those that exist have been instituted by God. I think sometimes the government, uh, the Lord allows us to elect governance, and, and he, he might be turning us over to our reprobate minds, yeah. almost like when the, when the Jewish people had a had their first king, God said, hey, I've got this I've got this system of judges in place. And they said, well, everybody else has a king. We want a king. He said, yeah. okay, yeah. I'll give you a king. And it didn't work out so well. Yeah. Um, so sometimes he turns us over to our minds. But he's the one that instituted government. Going on, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad conduct. Would you, have no, uh, would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. Yeah. For he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, no one should be uh, subject not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. So Paul is writing to the New Testament church, and he's saying, Governments have been established by God, given authority, the sword, to be able to render judgment and to be able to carry out, if, if need be, executions to be able to life for a life and all. Now I realize God's revelation is perfect. Our interpretation is where there are yes. flaws. So other people might be able to pull out a scripture and say, well, you know, Jesus says, uh, you know, beat your swords into plowshares and that sort of thing. And, and so, you know, we could cherry pick scriptures, but as you look at as a whole, it talks about respecting the authorities. So right. It seems that, so in Romans 13, I want to go back yeah. to that portion about the government not bearing the sword for nothing. Mm -hmm. Is that descriptive or is it prescriptive? We do know mm. that in Roman times, mm -hmm. they did carry out the death penalty. Yes. Uh, in fact, if you did not worship Caesar, burn incense to Caesar, mm -hmm. you could be crucified. Right. You could be put to death for that. So for very small infractions. But was that, so we do know it happened, that's a description, but was it prescriptive? Does God say, uh, through Paul, who wrote the letter to the Romans, is that something that this is what is part of the government? And I'm putting it back out there. Maybe you mm -hmm. could read that portion mm -hmm. again. Sure, That sure. talks about that particular um, he, he, he Again, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, mm -hmm. but to bad. So he's saying, you should be afraid of the rulers if you do bad conduct, why should you be afraid? Well, because they're going to mete out justice. You go, what kind of justice? It goes on, um, do what is good. You will receive his approval, his being the, the ruling authority, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. It doesn't right. say he doesn't bear the keys to the jail in vain. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say he, 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 he bears the law book in vain. The, the idea it, it may be it may be descriptive it may it may be figurative instead of literal uh, but but the idea of a sword is an instrument of death yeah. and, and so I, I believe that what Paul is saying is the the government having the right to be able to bear the sword and because of that we need to be afraid yeah that we might receive justice from the government for our wrongdoing. Yeah, no, and I, I would tend to agree with that. Also, in it's either first or second Peter, the thought mm -hmm. is reiterated where the government, the purpose of government is what Peter says, is to reward those who do good and to punish, punish. those who do evil. Right. And I believe the part about the sword is there as well, where the sword is an instrument of execution. It's not just a punishment, a regular, it's not being put in jail. Uh, or a slap on the wrist, but the sword was uh, an indication of capital punishment. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ron, we know that biblically, uh, it, first of all, 
I want to take a step back here that human beings are created in the image of God. We were, we were made to walk with God and to have fellowship with him. But of course we fell in the garden. Yeah. So we're, we, uh, we've lost that standing with God and we do know that we live in a fallen and corrupt world. Uh, God did not make us for the death penalty. We were made to walk in righteousness right. and goodness and to walk with him. However, when we transgress and get to a point where we've taken somebody else's life, we read in a few later chapters in Genesis, Genesis 9, 6, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. It seems to me that that was the institution of the death penalty there, mm -hmm. as I mm -hmm. understand it. Yeah. We see it reiterated in the New Testament in Romans 13, and then Peter, uh, in one of his letters, does uh, reiterate that as well. But as Christians, uh, 21st century Christians in the United States, how do we get our minds around that? Is this maybe just something for the 2,000 years ago? Can't, haven't we become enlightened? No, we do have prisons. We do have the possibility of a life without mm -hmm. parole. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Do we need to follow through with the death penalty? It's a great question. And I think one of the things that Christians do and I, I think this is wrong. They say, well, let's just let the government decide. You know, I, I, I'm going to keep, let's keep our religious point of view out of it. And you and I advocate all the time, if we don't carry our faith everywhere we go to include into the government arena, then really does our faith serve us? Um, or, or is it really a part of us? Um, and, and so I think as believers, we need to weigh this. We need to search scripture and we need to be able to say to our elected officials, this is this is what I believe. This is what I believe what God is saying to me. And if you disagree with me, we can respectfully disagree with each other. In that scripture that you're talking about in 1 Peter 2, verse 13, submit yourself, this is in the King James Version, to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or into governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. So the government has been established by God to be able to reward those who do well and to punish those that are done evil. So if our government institutes a death penalty and they say a life for a life, the scripture here says submit yourself to that. Um, now, obviously, the very first thing people can say is, well, what about what about the government says abortion is right? Well, we, we, we're as believers, we have to, as long as the scriptures, excuse me, as long as government walks in line with scriptures, then, then th that that's where we need to. And you know, I, I realize we're on a slippery slope there, but I, I believe that scriptures validate the the the, the uh, role of government, saying uh, we can wield the sword and use it to punish evil doers. Yeah, that's a can of worms you opened up with mm -hmm. the uh, yeah, abortion yeah. issue, yeah. and then it brings in the question of right. is the government a just government uh, by allowing mm -hmm. unborn children to be taken in the womb? But hey, if we can't uh, but, ask those tough questions of God, I mean, God's ready for these tough questions. He is. Um, we don't understand all, all of it. but And we need to seek him and his Absolutely. wisdom. Ron, we need to take a, a, a hard oh, break. Okay. Right. So hold that thought. We'll come back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Commonwealth Matters. I'm your host, Richard Nelson, here with uh, Pastor Ron Hicks, uh, Pastors Henderson Memorial Baptist Church. And we have a, a challenging discussion <laughs> yes, on the death penalty, mm -hmm. uh, capital punishment from uh, the authorities. Of course, the federal government just carried out its first federal execution in 17 years. Daniel Lewis Lee, uh, age 47, of Yukon, Oklahoma, was put to death uh, early uh, Tuesday morning uh, by injection uh, in Terre Haute, Indiana. Uh, Ron, he maintained, uh, he Daniel Lewis innocent. Lane, that he maintained his yeah. innocence. He said he didn't do it. He said, you're executing an innocent man. He He's said, I've done a lot of wrong yeah, things, yeah. Mm -hmm. done a lot of wrong things, but I'm not a murderer. Right. Now, we do have a number of people who have been on death row yeah. that have, by DNA evidence, they've been exonerated right. of crimes that they were accused of before DNA was a, a regular tool right. in criminal justice. I'm glad you brought that up. Because, so what yeah. should there, I mean, I don't know the case here. I don't know if they had DNA right. evidence on them. I do know this. Uh, I've been involved with prison ministry for several years. Mm -hmm. I've gotten to know prisoners. I get, I'm get. i very familiar with the mindset. A lot of the guys there are <laughs> going to tell knows. you that they're innocent. You <laughs> right. know that too because you've yes. been involved with prison ministry. Yeah. Yeah. 
but uh, there are some cases where there are innocent people that are. And that's where up. that's where I can say it, I do not believe that capital punishment is contrary to Scripture. As a matter of fact, I, I, I would go on the other side saying that government's been established by God and, and brings about justice. I do know, though, that humanity is flawed. And some people say, well, because we're flawed and all the rest of that, then, then don't do it at all. I don't think we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. If I could use that um, uh, imagery with, with the, the death penalty, I, I do think, though, that there needs to be beyond a shadow of a doubt. Not reasonable doubt, but I believe, um, you know, if, if there is no DNA evidence, if, if, let's say, the DNA evidence is too old or that sort of thing, I, I would say if there's no means to exonerate this person, then, then commute the death penalty, life in prison. I, I believe that if, if a person um, has, a, has a case and it's been heard, but there wasn't DNA evidence, I believe an automatic um, appeal process should be instituted. People say it's going to cost money and all the rest of it. Yes, but life is that valuable. So I believe before it's done, every effort needs to be exhausted. And if there's not a way to exonerate people with the DNA evidence, again, because it might be too old or the evidence has been thrown away, that person has not been given equal opportunity under the law. So they ought to commute the death penalty. Yeah. We ought to pay for the rest of their lives to keep them in prison. Um, and, but so we I, I, we don't do it just willy nilly. And yeah. in the past, if people have been on death row um, and and then been exonerated, then we have to assume people have been executed who have been innocent. Yeah. I think and that's a fair assumption. Yeah, that's yeah. a fair assumption. Yeah. We did see Illinois governor a couple of few years ago. Ex, uh, commuted mm -hmm. all of the sentences of those on death row. And this is because they found that a number of people were on death row that r DNA over evidence overturned right. their connection to whatever crime it was. So I think your proposal that there be DNA evidence in order to put somebody to death, that elevates the standard, does not yes. do away with the death penalty. Mm -hmm. no. It just elevates the standard to where there's no shadow of a doubt. Your right. DNA does not lie. Right. And uh, I think that that's one safeguard that can be uh, put into place. But perhaps that DNA evidence should be put into place in other crimes where there are no witnesses. By the way, mm -hmm. it's a biblical idea that there are two or three witnesses mm -hmm. before somebody's convicted of a crime. Right. You know, that in this country, we have that principle, too. Sure. There needs to be witnesses. Uh -huh. Now, so looking at DNA, would that be considered a witness? It certainly testifies against you because it's, speaking, it's right. like a fingerprint oh, yeah. in, in a sense. And sometimes but, Christian, people will say, I love this, just kind of as an aside. People will say, I, I don't believe in religion. I believe in science. But, well, you and I believe in science, too. You have <laughs> right. a degree in That's science, right. and That's I used right. to design and build television stations. pretty scientific. Yeah. Um, those aren't mutually exclusive. So, yes, we can yeah. use science as a witness to be able to carry out what we believe to be the biblical principle, but if there's not supporting scientific evidence beyond a shadow of a doubt, then I believe we as compassionate people have to give the benefit of the doubt. Reasonable doubt says you've been convicted guilty, We're gonna you're going to spend life in jail, but there's not enough evidence to actually take your life. And I believe that that's equitable. Yeah, Ron, it's a terrible thing when the state takes the life of yes. another person. It's and not it's something to celebrate. No, it, you're right. It's not something to applaud or to get you know excited about. But at the same time, it's a terrible thing when citizens take the lives of other Absolutely. citizens. And it's my opinion that the one reason why a just society has the death penalty is to elevate just how precious life is. It's a terrible thing to execute somebody. It's a terrible thing to allow murders to continue in a society. And it is a reminder to people that life is precious. And if you take the life of somebody else unjustly, uh, not in self-defense, but if you have premeditated murder, uh, then your life will be required of you. And you let that sink down deeply into, into the bones of the citizenry, so to speak. And that is a reminder that life is precious. You take in a life unjustly, your life will be required. And this is, I think, uh, one thing that does deter murders. Uh, some say, well, it's not a deterrent. I don't know well, if I think it's a deterrent. Is, is uh, you know, I, I, go ahead, finish your thoughts. Well, here, here's yeah, why yeah. I think mm -hmm. it's a deterrent. Okay. Because it is a message that the death penalty is out there and that, yes, there are high consequences to uh, taking somebody's life unjustly. Uh, so whether or not it's actually in the moment going to stop somebody, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I think by and large, if people thought, here's, let me juxtapose it with mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. If you 
realize that you committed a murder and maybe would only do five or ten years, do you think there'd be more murders if it wasn't that high of a penalty, high that high of a price to pay? My guess would be that, yeah, the people would, life was, it, at least implicitly, the message is that life is not that important. I might do five to ten years, but I'm not going to get the death penalty mm -hmm. or I'm not going to get life in prison. I think the higher this, the, the consequences you have for a crime, uh, the, the greater the impact on the, on the general population. They realize that there are consequences. Mm -hmm. The death penalty is the highest consequence. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think um, um, I, I understand completely that, that thinking, and, and that, that may very well be I, without, you know, uh, I, many murders are, are happen in the moment, crimes of passion, that sort of thing. Um, whether or not anybody thinks of the consequences while they're committing that crime, regardless, it does say to society, life is sacred, life is valuable, yeah. and whether you thought about it, whether it's a crime of passion or not, if it's unjustifiable and that it's not defending yourself and your family, you will pay with your life, um, then, then yes, it sends a signal. Unfortunately, our government right now says... Life isn't really important, and and we we do see I the cheapening of life. We see it in that's this is a probably a whole other program, but <laughs> yeah, we see the cheapening of life in the womb. Yeah, we also see the yeah. move towards assisted suicide, where yeah, if somebody feels they're like sure. they're at the end of their mm -hmm. life, it's okay to help somebody take their own life. We are seeing the cheapening of human life, and that's unfortunate as Christians. And we're going to have to mm -hmm. close on this note. Mm -hmm. We should care about all life. We oh. should care about the preservation yes. and the preserving the dignity of life. But there are consequences yes. when you take an innocent life. Ron, we, uh, we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining me on this edition Thank of the Commonwealth. God bless you, listeners. Thank you for participating.